Welcome to today's webinar on getting back on the road to recovery, focusing and developing recovery goals. This webinar is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center or MHTTC, housed at Rutgers, the School of Health Professions in the Department of Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. My name is Kathy and I'm the project coordinator of the center and will be facilitating the webinar today. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. The MHTTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health and other related workforces to deliver evidence-based and empirically supported practices to individuals with mental illnesses. Please visit the MHTTC Network website for additional information at mhttcnetwork.org. Next slide, please. If you're interested in staying up to date with the events and products the Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC is providing, please sign up to receive our email communications. You can sign up at the bit.ly link provided on the screen. Next slide. We also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website along with the PowerPoint slides in the next couple of days. Following the webinar, you will also be asked to complete a brief survey. We value this feedback and use it to improve our activities and inform future activities. The surveys are also important because our continued funding is linked to the completion of these surveys. So we thank you in advance for your feedback. Next slide, please. We encourage you to interact with our presenters during the webinar by using the chat feature. Please post any questions or comments you have in the chat and I will collect your questions as we go and ask them of the presenter during the Q&A time towards the end of the presentation. During the webinar, our presenter may pose questions to you. Please use the chat feature to answer these questions. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA. All material appearing in this presentation, except that taken directly from copyrighted sources, is in the public domain. It may be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Citation of the source is appreciated. This presentation, as mentioned before, will be recorded and posted on our website. At the time of this presentation, Eleanor McCann's Katz is serving as SAMHSA Assistant Secretary. The opinions expressed herein are the views of the presenters and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No official support or endorsement of DHHS, SAMHSA, for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. Now let's begin our webinar. We have with us Joni Dolce with us today. Joni is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatric Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions at Rutgers School of Health Professions. Joni has several years of experience working in behavioral healthcare settings, namely support employment. Joni teaches courses in the department's undergraduate program as well as providing training and technical assistance to behavioral healthcare providers. Her research interests include staff training and employment services. She presents nationally on the topic of employment services and is listed as a Society for Human Resource Management recommended speaker on the topic of creating workplaces that support mental health. So welcome, Joni. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kati. Um, so this is session one of a two-part series. Um, they, are, they are standalone webinars, so you don't have to attend both, but this focuses primarily on uh, getting back on the road to recovery and focusing and developing recovery goals. Um, during the current pandemic, it may have been difficult for many individuals participating in behavioral health services to really focus on recovery goals. Um, they, there may have been interruptions or disruptions to individuals' lives due to personal illness, economic factors, increased family responsibilities, progress toward recovery goals, such as employment, education, living and wellness goals may have been put on hold while basic needs are addressed. 
This webinar provides some information to help practitioners identify tools and strategies and some resources to assist individuals with refocusing on recovery goals. We're going to also talk about SMART goal planning and applying the SMART framework to recovery goal planning. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to define recovery, talk a little bit about re what recovery is and the definition of recovery. We're also going to dig a little bit deep into what the impact of the current pandemic has been on wellness and recovery goals. And as Kati mentioned, we really appreciate the interaction and um, encourage you to respond to the different questions that we uh, will be posing. We're also going to uh, look a little bit at the services and practices that support recovery principles, and finally, applying SMART goal planning. When we think about recovery, I love this image of a beautiful um, sunset, just spark, sparkling in the sky, just something hopeful and kind of there's a renewed quality about looking at this um, picture. But William Anthony, who sadly recently passed away this year, um, kind of coined or was part of a group of researchers and theorists early on in psychiatric rehabilitation and behavioral health services to describe recovery and talk about recovery and what that means to many people. This quote of his um, really is even more important today um, during the pandemic and what we're all experiencing Recovery involves the development of new meaning and purpose in one's life as one grows beyond that catastrophic, the catastrophic effects of mental illness. Um, if we think about applying that to what's currently happening today, we have all needed to adjust to the current situation and move and grow beyond the challenges that are currently present. So that's just sort of a brief description of recovery and, and Pat Deegan, other recovery theorists have really um, talked a lot about recovery from both a clinical perspective and a personal narrative and, and what it means. Um, and this statement here really is coming from that personal perspective. Um, it's not necessarily just the diminished symptoms or reduction in service use, but recovery is this development of new meaning and purpose. And we all may have had to embrace this idea over the last seven months. When we think about recovery, there are services and practices and supports that really do help to um, uh, help individuals achieve recovery goals. And, and these guiding principles SAMHSA have de has developed to really help guide us in our work as practitioners. Um, we'll go over these very briefly, but hope. Hope is something that's so critical now in all of our lives. Um, believing that recovery is real and goal achievement is, is real. As I mentioned, people may have had to put goals on hold or um, needed to postpone some important events such as going back to school or, or going back to work because of what's going on, um, but helping to really instill that hope, helping to cultivate and foster hope is so important to help individuals overcome and believe that they can get through some of the challenges and barriers that they may be confronted with right now. Um, recovery also has many pathways. Um, really looking at individuals and understanding that people are unique and have different strengths and goals and interests and helping people understand and, and develop and cultivate what some of those strengths might be um, to help individuals identify a pathway to recovery. For some people, as Pat Deegan, who is a recovery theorist, identifies going back to work or going back to school is a pathway that helps um, achieve other recovery goals. So recognizing that people have unique and personalized uh, pathways and 
and ways to um, achieve recovery. And for some people that may be um, going and in, and in, in increasing therapy or, or other types of more clinically focused uh, for others, it may be more personalized. Really looking at it being person driven recovery really is a very personalized um, area. So, so helping people really make choices and encourage choices. Um, peer support is so important. Now during the pandemic, I've seen how important that peer support is just for my own um, achievement of different goals and, and um, even just knowing that colleagues and other peers and friends are available. So really encouraging individuals that you're working with to access other people that they know, whether it's people who are maybe attending some similar programs or other people in their lives if they are working or going to school, accessing different students or colleagues that they might know. Um, holistic, this idea that recovery isn't just one area of a person's life. It's not just mental health recovery or um, symptom reduction, but includes many facets, including employment and community integration and other goals that relate to the person as a whole. Culture is very important as practitioners. It's even more important now to be culturally mindful and competent, recognizing that um, people may be within certain cultures. Um, and now that we're all social distancing and, and quarantining in some areas, that recognition and knowledge of what an individual's culture is all about is so important when you're working with someone towards recovery goals. Recovery principles address trauma. And again, now very important during this time where this uh, current pandemic might be uh, creating trauma in individuals' lives. People might be feeling um, a way that intensifies traumatic experiences that they may have encountered in the past. Strengths focused, we mentioned how important rec recognizing and building on individual strengths is when we consider recovery, respect and relational. So helping people develop um, relations and relationships in the community, foster those relationships, help individuals identify those natural supports in their lives and, and ultimately being respectful of what individuals are interested in and also being respectful that people still do have goals and recovery goals. And although there may be times now where more basic needs need to be met, it is um, important to continue to help the person very respectful to the person to recognize that their goals are important and helping them to reach those goals or identify a strategy or a way to achieve those goals. It looks like we have a few chats. Kati, anything that we need to address now? Oh, just people people welcoming and saying hello. Perfect. Um, it yes, looks like have... um, many people are joining us. Um, thank you for all of your um, greetings. Yes, looks like we have a variety of people from a variety of different places. Welcome. So let's let's talk about goals. Let's transition from you know this basic overview of recovery to now goals and how to help someone refocus and revisit some of their recovery goals. So when we think about goals, we really want to recognize the importance of having goals and and the value that having a goal plays in our lives. They provide a clear vision of what we might want to achieve. They offer a direction. They also help to stimulate hope. So if someone is in a current situation where economically they may have um, lost their jobs or have been furloughed or have had to postpone career plans because of the current ec economy and the current situation, helping to 
really revisit what some of those long-term goals might be helps to stimulate hope and helps us to really believe that there is a light at the end of this tunnel, kind of like that visual of the sun that I showed earlier. Goals also provide a sense of accomplishment. So we might be really feeling in a funk for lack of a better word and really just not feeling like there's much being accomplished. We're, we're home personally. Uh, I've been home uh, working out of a tiny little office for the last several months and Although, you know, there's lots of accomplishments that are happening by Zoom and webinars, there is this kind of feeling that there's not much going on. So helping to identify even short-term goals for me, even wellness-related goals have, have been extremely helpful to recognize that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And these goals are helping to work towards some of the larger goals and, and long-term goals I might have. And the goals are always developed by, by the individual, always person first, always very client centered. The person in recovery is really the one guiding the process. Some recovery goals might include, just so we're all kind of speaking the same language about what recovery goals are. They might include goals around employment, career goals, education goals, living goals. So it might be, um, a goal to move into a new apartment or a new house or purchase a home or whatever that might be. They might be social or community goals. So goals that have to do with improving um, interactions in the community or involvement in the community. And that might be a little tough during this time of social distancing. Nevertheless, that could be something that someone is really interested in pursuing. And as practitioners, we need to really think about how to assist that person in continuing to remain in the community and, and accessing some of those community integration goals in light of the social distancing that's happening in many of our region and many of, of the states here. Um, health and well being. So now more than ever, having goals centered around wellness and well-being are so important um, and can help carry a person into um, other areas of their lives. So having uh, set and being able to achieve well-being and wellness related goals now could really set the person up very nicely for future goal attainment. Um, kind of having those wellness goals in place and wellness um, strategies and interventions, if you will, in place now could really help to improve um, other areas of one's life. So some examples of a recovery goal for employment might be, um, I intend to work in a sales job in the New Brunswick area by January of 2021, or it might be something living related. I intend to live in my own studio apartment in Rahway by January 2021, or it could even be um, in education related. Um, I intend to enroll in a class, one course at Union County College, which is a college near us by September of 2021. So helping someone identify what some of those long-term goals might be. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about identifying short-term goals to help again with that instilling hope and belief that it's possible. So this would be really helpful to hear from you all how COVID-19 and the current situation that we're all encountering now has in have it, ha how has this impacted or what challenges have you observed that impact individuals recovery goals so you can use the chat it looks like vicky feels in the same same funk right now i i agree um so if you want to use the chat to talk about what challenges have you observed that impact individuals' recovery goals? 
or even your own recovery goals? What are some of the challenges? And it, um, when you write in the chat, make sure that you're writing to everyone. So there's a little drop down menu that you can click on. It says either all panelists or you might have to change it to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see what you're writing. Kati's going to help me kind of look at the chat and see what people are writing, but yes, Hedion said that COVID has caused isolation, which increases use. Absolutely, that isolation has, um, and they've done some, some research on this during this time, has really impacted substance use and alcohol use. Uh, Sarah writes, lack of in-person services available in the community. Absolutely so, not having those in-person opportunities to engage with, with individuals. People might not be seeking services, Selenia is mentioning. Um, absolutely, people might not be seeking services right now because of what's happening. We have, we've, uh, Adam mentions seeing an increase in, in uh, incidents of mental health symptoms, isolation, and the impacts of racial, racial injustice, absolutely. So you're seeing that, um, and that's all impacting an individual's recovery goals. The isolation is impacting goal-directed um, behaviors or goal-directed um, people really reaching for their goals, um, social goals as well as mental health goals. Kristen mentions um, the, the fewer in-person support groups are impacting recovery and recovery goals. So you're all coming up with so many wonderful challenges. And I guess our next discussion would be how do we mitigate some of those challenges? How do we help someone continue to focus on recovery goals, such as employment, education, living, health and wellness, uh, socializing. How do we continue to focus and revisit those goals that people may have put on hold? I'm just looking through the chat right now. Some people have a lack of internet services, limited resources, lack of access to mobile devices. One person mentions having one individual that they're working with um, worked at the partial care program. And now with the services being um, eliminated, he lost that support and the money. So economically people are being in impacted. Oh, there's so much in the chat. So you know, we won't have a chance to re review all of this, but uh, clients are refusing to, to see me for fear of COVID, the lack of support, absolutely all of these areas, um, you know, go through the chat and, and peek while we're, while we're moving on. But yes, these are all impacting people's recovery goals. So let's move into maybe a, a tiny bit of recent article, um, our director, Dr. Murphy and colleagues wrote about challenges identified in New York in New York uh, state and city. And a lot of those centered around individuals' um, basic needs. So a lot of you in the chat identified that people uh, economically are being impacted, financially being impacted, uh, supports are, are, are not as available. Absolutely an increase in symptoms. There's been a lot, a lot more isolation and, and that anxiety and fear. And these are all themes that developed from the survey that, that we sent out specifically asking providers in New York, what were some of the challenges to providing services right now? And you echoed many of the challenges that we found in the survey uh, that we recently published. Um, so yes, these are, these are certainly grounded in fact and, and people are, are really having a difficult time managing what's what's going on in terms of basic needs being met, symptoms increasing, the isolation is, is really creating a lot of anxiety and fear in addition to the anxieties and fears related to actually um, concerns about contracting COVID-19. So there's a lot going on. So let's think about how we can begin to recognize and acknowledge 
our role as providers in revisiting and focusing on goals. Um, and please use the chat, give questions throughout. Um, we have about a half an hour left, so I wanted to maybe focus this next half an hour on what we can do and, and introduce some of the SMART goal planning. But let's look at long-term goals. So individuals may have had some long-term goals to uh, get a job or go back to school and, and um, they may have, the person may have had some very clear recovery goals to move out. And those goals may have been put on hold for now because of some of the situation that's happening. Uh, they, the person may have been anticipating going in person to school or um, there, there, there may not be available houses or, or apartments or other areas to move into. So some of that may have been put on hold. Short-term goals may be the way to go and, and focusing on helping someone identify a short-term goal, something that is achievable, something that is something that uh, shouldn't take much effort, but can instill that hope and help someone believe that that long-term goal is attainable. Um, and a way to do that is through using the SMART framework for goal planning. And we're gonna get into that now, but if we think about what someone's long-term goal might be, um, a long-term goal might be, I will graduate from Rutgers University with a BS degree in accounting by May, 2026. So that still may be the person's long-term goal. Maybe that date needs to be adjusted a bit. Um, and the short-term goal for that person might be um, to enroll, enroll or apply to maybe the local county college, if that's the only option right now. Um, as an accounting student, by maybe this January to start in the spring semester. So helping that person look at what their long-term goal is and identifying some short-term goals to help work towards that. And again, those short-term goals should be something that's really achievable and attainable right now to really instill some hope and belief that um, long-term goal achievement is, is certainly possible. So when we think about focusing, um, I'm kind of pulling this from the motivational interviewing literature and motivational interviewing information. But when we think about focusing, it really does include um, helping someone identify direction toward change. And when we think about focusing, um, it really is based on first having developed a relationship with the person. So in order to help someone really focus on what's important and what a short-term goal or long-term goal might be, we really have to put the work in to engage and develop a relationship to make sure that we are um, viewed by the person as trusting and someone who's helpful and supportive. So putting that work in, making sure that we're using our active listening, making sure that we are attending to the person, even if it is remotely, making sure that we are um, using those counseling techniques and counseling skills to engage with the person so that we can begin helping that person focus on what it is that they would like to change or, or what they would like to achieve and spend some time really helping that person hone in on what that goal might be and how that person might um, achieve whatever that goal that they're interested in achieving is and helping not only hone in on what the goal is, but prioritizing right now, what is priority? What, what is something that the person needs to prioritize to achieve a goal? Um, one way to do that is to help the person really look at um, what are some of those po positive qualities? What are some of those strengths that the person has? What are some of those um, areas in the person's life that can be 
uh, further explored and identified as a short-term achievable goal. So really spending some time helping the person focus now, refocus. And um, as pr practitioners, we're also sending the message when we continue to talk about goals, we continue to keep the conversation about what the person's recovery goals are in the forefront of the discussion and our interactions. It again, creates this expectation and um, recognition that the person is eventually going to get to where they want to be. Um, we're sending the message of optimism and, and belief that it's possible. So this probably looks familiar to some individuals. Um, when we think about SMART goals, um, it's broken down into this acronym, S-M-A-R-T, and it is a nice clean way of thinking about developing goals. When we develop goals that are in this SMART framework, it really does help to specify achievable goals that are um, time bound. So, so goals that aren't just floating out there, you know, someday I'll do this, or maybe um, when I'm, you know, this age, or maybe when I'm, when my kids are gone or whatever that nebulous maybe in the near future might be, a SMART goal helps to really sort of neaten things up and, and helps it to identify specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goals. So when we think about specific, we want to help the person or even ourselves, we could use this framework when we're thinking about our own, own goals, um, help the person look at a very specific piece of who, what, when, and where, and how. So the goals should be straightforward and they should emphasize what you want to happen. So in order for a goal to really be effective, it does need to be specific. Um, it should answer some of the questions like what needs to be accomplished, who needs to, to be responsible for it. So um, some goals might, I mean, most of the goals, certainly the person in recovery is responsible for, but there may be areas that uh, supports might be might be necessary. What steps will the person take to achieve it? So thinking through these different questions really helps us to identify very specific goals. Measurable. So if possible, including a numeric or any sort of des descriptive measurement is helpful. Um, so that we can measure progress or help the person measure progress and see changes over, over time. So it might be including a number such as your, uh, if someone is interested in reducing bad cholesterol numbers. So even identifying, you know, wanting to reduce my bad cholesterol by 10 points um, or wanting to lose eight pounds um, or putting in three job applications over the next week. So very being very measurable so that the person can track how close or, or how they are um, working towards that goal. It's um, when we quantify a goal, it really makes it much easier to track that pro pro progress. And we also know when we've kind of reached the end or the finish line. Um, and that, again, builds on, on um, each of those successes build on one another. And they are really impactful when you think about self-efficacy and belief that uh, achievement is possible of any goal when, they be, when people begin to see those small steps being accomplished. And think about your own goals that you have. Um, it'd be really disheartening to never see any progress or never see any um, measurable way of, of tracking 
how close you are to achieving that goal. So even when you can see one or two of those um, metrics being met is, is certainly important and does matter when you're trying to help someone achieve a goal. This idea of attainable or achievable, you might also see for the A, for the SMART framework, um, it should be something that is empowering. Goals are something that are empowering to us, right? Um, that, so it shouldn't be something that is so unachievable or unattainable that we never ever get there and we're never able to see any progress made. So it should be a conversation that you have with someone to make sure that this is something that is achievable. This is something that the person is able to attain um, so that you can really kind of move beyond that if, if it's never achievable, you're just stuck and feeling pretty horrible about yourself, quite frankly, if, if it's not something that's uh, realistic. But it shouldn't be too easy. It shouldn't be something that's um, so reachable that uh, it requires no effort. It should require a fair bit of effort, but just something that's within reach. And then goals should also be relevant, or you may also see realistic um, it really does need to be something, and it goes back to those recovery principles that the person is identifying that really fits within that holistic idea of, of what the person's interests are and what the person is interested in achieving. And, and that self-determination is really fulfilled and cultivated when that goal is, is relevant to the person. Um, and then time bound. So it should be, have some sort of timeline. Um, I could say all day I'm going to lose eight pounds, but if I don't really give myself a time frame to do that, it really just sort of sits there and never happens. Or if I say I'm going to reduce my stress by going to yoga via Zoom twice a week, but if I never give myself a start date, like starting next week or starting Monday, it just sort of sits there. And for me, it never really happens. So helping that person identify a realistic time frame to help them really look at a deadline and a clear target to work toward. So just a quick yes or no poll. Do you use SMART goal documentation in your work? Or is there another, um, let's see. Yep, so it looks like many people, so you're familiar with the SMART goal planning. Um, are there other frameworks that people use? There are also Rumba, which is another way, another kind of framework to use. Looks like a lot of the chat's coming in. Yes, 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 yes. Um, any no's, anyone not use SMART goal documentation? And you don't have to write that or send it in the chat, but if you're, if you're not using it, um, there's a little video in the resource section that kind of gives you a very brief overview of using SMART goal planning. And it's, it's again, three to four minutes, but it's very brief. And I think it's a nice visual for you to look at and maybe as a team, but let's look at some smart goals and do a really tiny activity just to see if the goals are following the framework. And then if not, let's look at what changes might need to be made to help the goals um, fulfill more of that smart framework. So I don't know if there's a poll, Kati, a yes or no poll, or you could just write in the chat. So does this follow the smart goal framework? Hi, Joni. Yes. So I just launched a poll. Okay. I will improve my health by reducing my bad cholesterol numbers by 10 points before January 2021. Okay. So we have, looks like the majority of people think that that's a smart goal. Looks like people are still voting. A couple people are saying no. Maybe we'll have a chance to chat with some of the respondents. 
or at least chat in the actual chat room. Okay, so it looks like we people have have submitted their vote. Um, the majority of people, 86%, yes, it is a smart goal. A couple people, 14%, no, it's not. Um, we have someone in the chat. So, yep, Renee said yes. Uh, for the for um, we have one more in the chat. Let me, double, let me look on that. Okay. Yep. So people, Elizabeth brings up a great point by doing what, what will the person do to make it happen? Absolutely. So they didn't say by doing what. So I think that's a really great point. I will improve my health by reducing my bad cholesterol numbers by 10 points before January 2020. Somewhat specific, but missing that piece of, um, I will improve my health by eating better, by um, incorporating vegetables and fruits into my diet, by um, you know, reducing my intake of fatty foods to reduce the bad cholesterol number. So yes, I think adding that, um, yep, so you guys, you guys got it. Um, missing the element to indicate what will be done to attain the goal. Yep, um, this could be an object, objective, absolutely. Regular sleep pattern, um, that's more so interventions, it, yep. So I think you guys all kind of hit the nail on the head and, and saw through my little veiled attempt to it, trickery, but yes, there's no real clear description of how the person will improve their health. How are they going to reduce the bad cholesterol? So you really wanna help the person be, be very specific. It is measurable, right? I mean, they wanna reduce it by, by 10 points. Um, however, the, it is missing some key pieces. All right, let's move on. I will enroll as a full-time student I will enroll as a full-time college student by 1-15-2021. Okay, 50-50 it looks like. Okay, so what does this look more closely like? This may be one of a situation where we're looking at a short-term goal. Again, 50-50 um, split, uh, I will enroll as a full-time college student by 1-15. So let's see, um, yep, absolutely. It's an objective to get the goal of, of the degree. Another way of kind of objective would be more of a short-term goal. So yes, those objectives, um, Elizabeth, yes, makes, it sounds more like a wish, not a goal. So it's not very specific, not very measurable. Um, well, I guess, I mean, the, you know, you can tell if you're enrolled or not, but um, absolutely. So a lot of these take some thought and, and discussion and planning to think about how to really help the person. Um, yes, and uh, mentions as well, more like a dream or a wish, not a goal as such. Nope. So um, not a SMART goal. What would make this a SMART goal? What would be, if someone could write in the chat, what would make this a SMART goal? Let's see. Career choice, okay. How many hours are they going to take? What's the college name? Yep, so you kind of are very specific. Um, what makes, yep, which college, which course? Absolutely. Have the money saved to enroll. So there's a lot, a lot more that could be said to make this a SMART goal, obtain the requirements. So you guys are good. I will complete an outpatient program. Is this a SMART goal or no? Yes or no? No, nope, not at all, right? What's it missing? It's missing a lot. It's missing 
most of, yes, Elizabeth, it's missing everything. So, and what it's also missing is, is this really a relevant goal for someone? Is it really someone's own personalized goal to complete an outpatient program? Or is that something that may be more um, an external person or something externally that's kind of uh, creating this, this goal. Um, the person may not really believe that they want to complete an outpatient program. The person's goal might be much more personalized and m might be more of those recovery goals that we talked about, right? The social, living, employment, education goals. Um, so I think this is missing quite a bit. So, um, Yes, I think that Adam is writing more crisis, more suicidality, more recurrence of symptoms. Um, yep. So you guys are really on a roll. So the next one is, I will start to look for jobs near me by 10 30, 2020. Smart goal? Nope. Let's see, you're still voting. All right. Looks like we could probably end in this poll. Um, majority of people said, no, it's not a smart goal. Um, Adrian, yep, you're right. What kinds of jobs, where, what field, what does start to look for a job mean? Absolutely, it should be number of applications to submit. You're absolutely right, Kristen. Um, it looks like another, another um, person's writing research applications. Elizabeth, absolutely, how many hours per week? So all of those missing ingredients do not make it a SMART goal. Um, and the reason why we're really focusing on this idea of, of emphasizing, and it sounds like really reiterating to many of you who are already using a SMART framework, is this is really a very challenging time for many people. And to have these sort of ambiguous, non-committal type goals really doesn't help us to get out of that feeling of of, um, you know, of just not of lack of accomplishment or that feeling that we're not doing anything or that feeling that, um, you know, our goals are put on hold possibly indefinitely. So helping to look at this SMART framework helps us to really believe that we can achieve these smaller goals that are working towards some larger ones. And we're not just putting things on hold indefinitely. And, all, and now might be a time when people do need to focus more on goals that are related to wellness and health. Um, but again, setting these up in a smart framework can really help to make those goals more achievable to someone. So I was I just put this up here and you can we can either you can talk about this when you're uh, back but I just put it up here as a prompt, I will, and think about your own goal. Think about your own goal during this time and, and whether it's a wellness goal or another type of goal that you might've put on hold and think about how you can make that goal under the SMART, SMART framework or other um, framework more achievable or more attainable. Adrian uh, wrote in here, I agree people have to start somewhere to realize where they really want to be or not be in a particular field. Absolutely. Looks like we have a couple of people who raised their hands. I don't know if you wanted to write in the chat what your question was, but please use the chat room. But think about your own recovery goals or your own wellness goals right now or what you'd like to achieve and sort of fill in that blank. And again, you don't have to do that in the chat. You can just ponder that. Um, but it, practicing on ourselves 
helps us when we're working with someone and review with your supervisors, review with colleagues, spend some time during your team meetings, really reviewing um, goals that you've helped individuals set or, or sitting with, with individuals who are receiving services and really looking at the goals together and almost scrutinizing in a, in a good way how, um, how much they fit the SMART framework and explaining to the person the importance and the benefits of following that type of framework when they are developing goals. So a question to consider as we begin to end the webinar, um, how can the SMART framework improve your work with individuals during this time? So use the chat to begin thinking about how can this particular framework improve your work with individuals during this time, particularly around recovery goals and a re visiting or reconnection with some of the recovery goals that the person may have had. Elizabeth, um, it helps the person have focus on what is important to them. Yes, so continuing to maintain that focus, it creates structure and accountability. It gives the client and therapist a plan that is fluid, refocuses our work, move out of future and focus on what can be done now. Perfect, um, that's a beautiful illustration. Yes, it's. Um, focusing on what can what can be done right now, and, and we may be uncertain about what the future holds, but there are certainly things that can be accomplished now. It can be beneficial for continued growth and purpose. Adrian's response, um, in taking baby steps with this new normal, we get to revisit what we want in this moment now that we are different. Yes, yeah, so priorities may have shifted of helping someone to focus on the cliche new normal and, and new priorities might need to happen now. This, this might be a perfect time to help someone really relook at recovery goals and um, shift based on shifting priorities. Kaylee writes, tracking goals, hardship successes in a measurable way. Adam, many participants had to update their, reco their recovery plans because of the pandemic. Smart goal planning helps them to focus in domains they weren't previously addressing. Absolutely, someone may have been employed, may have been on a career path, and the pandemic may have, have shortened that or, or the or disrupted whatever employment the person might have had. So that domain may not have been previously addressed, but now it, it may need to be. Um, so yes, absolutely think about as we um, take some time for questions and answer, how using this framework can um, improve your work during this time. One more response, Adrian writes, I agree, SMART goals help them to take a look at, the, at all the domains now. Our next session, which again is not, um, are, you know, they're not built on one another, but it, we will be addressing the wellness domains, the eight domains of wellness and how um, kind of looking, just like Adrian said, looking at the different SMART goals um, and, and how um, all the domains might look very different now. And recovery plans look different now with virtual treatment. Nicole is writing that. I, I agree. And I think your colleagues here would agree that recovery plans may look different. However, recovery goals may still be something that the person is interested in revisiting and refocusing on. And I think we, we um, really want to just hammer home that idea that People may need to adjust expectations, people may need to reprioritize, and people may need to include other goals such as wellness and health goals at this time. However, as providers, really helping someone to continue that focus on the more longer term recovery goals helps to continue that road uh, to recovery. So we defined recovery very briefly and explored some of those guiding principles of recovery services that support uh, recovery and recovery goals. We also looked briefly at the potential impact of COVID-19, and then we 
reviewed and applied some SMART goal planning. We are approaching, as Kati mentioned in the chat, our Q&A time. So please feel free to use uh, the chat room for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Joni. Um, so as Joni mentioned, we are in approaching the Q&A portion of our webinar. So if you had any specific questions that you'd like addressed, um, this is the time to do so. You can either enter them into the chat box or in the Q&A pod. But in the meantime, um, Joni, could you please um, forward the slides to our evaluation uh, slide? Yep. Resources, just so you, you know, some of the resources that are here um, relate to recovery, but also the small, SMART goal video, motivational interviewing as well, and wellness and recovery action plan apps and um, specific code of COVID-19 information. Thank you, Joni, for sharing those um, valuable resources. So as previously mentioned, um, our, we are a SAMHSA funded um, center. And as part of our funding, um, we are required to submit data related to the quality of this event. So if you do have a smartphone, you can use the QR code that is um, posted on the screen right now in the Zoom presentation. And um, you can take a brief survey. Um, I will also follow up uh, um, with sending an email that contains this link as well. Um, so um, some feedback that we're receiving in the chat is, as part of our treatment planning process, we include strengths and barriers to achieving goals. That's correct. Yes. So that's sometimes a, a Joni, would you agree that's a pre discussion that you have in, in preparation for goal planning? Yes. Yep. Certainly you want to really emphasize, and I don't know if I, if I made it clear in this presentation, but you really want to focus on what the person can do and will do and try to minimize, um, at least in the goal planning part, what the person can't do. So we really want to focus on the positives, focus on uh, really emphasizing what those strengths are. So yes, Nicole, I think you bring up a great point about um, including the strengths. So Joni, um, while someone submits a question. Um, we're waiting in the chat or the q and A. I I had a couple of questions here. Um, okay. uh, let's, could you elaborate more on the concept of focusing um, and why this is important in the goal planning process and also when reformulating or revisiting a goal, whether it was reached or not? So in terms of the re of the focusing, I think that's an important element of motivational interviewing and in the resources, I've, I've linked to the motivational interviewing website. You can get a little bit more information, but it really is um, to help structure those meetings to really, sometimes when I, I, I don't, I think Heidi mentioned I provided direct service for a number of years and even up until just a few years ago here at the university, but having those discussions it, early on in my career that were unfocused and really didn't accomplish mu much we really didn't see much progress. And once I began to incorporate some of the focusing techniques and really helping someone sit and um, uh, really get a sense of what it is that was the person's priority right now. What, what was it that the person really needed to focus on um, to, to achieve what they ultimately wanted to do? And I think, um, I think that focusing is important, but again, um, we do have to have established a trusting relationship and really had to establish um, engagement with the person before we go into the focusing and certainly well before we go into goal planning, we need to help um, with that focus. Absolutely. You, yeah. I, I agree with the establishing the therapeutic rapport. Um, we have a question here in the Q&A pod. Is there a specific window that you think is best to start goal planning around? Um, this person works with uh, people who are usually in crisis and not always is the, is the space to goal plan. I agree. Uh, when someone is in crisis, it's not a, a space to goal plan. However, if you're able to have met with the person prior, so if, if this is an existing relationship, putting in that work in the beginning of developing a relationship relationship, developing that therapeutic alliance with someone really helps when the person is in a, a crisis situation, 
to re remind the person of what their ultimate goals are. And, and maybe that's what our role is while someone's in a crisis to remind them that this will pass and to, to continue to have uh, um, eyes toward the future and, and what can be accomplished. And this is a blip in the road. And this is just, um, you know, one, one moment in their life that um, doesn't necessarily equate to giving up all of, all of the recovery goals and all of the, of the goals that the person has originally been striving towards. So making it very clear mm -hmm. and instilling that hope that this isn't just going to be what the person's, um, you know, life is all about, but right. uh, that, yep, Adrian echoes it. Ongoing support, positive enhancements help, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we are approaching um, the top of the hour at yeah. this time, and we really want to respect your time. So we really appreciate you all for joining us today. Joni, thank you for providing us with a valuable um, webinar on goal planning today. Um, I'm sure everyone took, had their valuable takeaways. Um, and as um, Joni previously mentioned, on November 11th, we are also hosting, um, you know, Joni will be presenting on incorporating the eight dimensions of wellness. And this will take place as mentioned before on November 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I will be sending a registration link to this webinar in our follow-up email. Um, and I, including in the follow-up email, I will also send um, links to the Zoom recording of today as, and also the presenter's slides um, and a certificate of completion that will be coming to your email in, in a few days. So um, again, we thank you for joining us and any last words, Joni? No, thank you. It's been a really nice um, hour to spend with you all. Thank you for your interactions and hopefully I'll see you on uh, November 11th. Yes, thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.